morning. If you would take your Bibles and open them up with me, we are going to be in Exodus chapter 14. Where we have left off is in chapter 13, talking about the nation of Israel leaving Egypt. Uh, we, we've seen the Passover happen. God has relayed to Israel how every male child, firstborn, uh, belongs to him. And we have gone through the idea of redemption. Uh, but all last chapter, there was five times one phrase was used over and over and over again. And as we're trying to understand scripture, things that are repeated over and over again should become very important to us. And it says in uh, verse 3, For by a powerful hand the Lord brought you out from this place. Uh, end of verse 9. For with a powerful hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt. End of verse 14. With a powerful hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. End of 15. Uh, I mean, end of 16. For with a powerful hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. So this idea of the ten plagues and what God has done to bring Pharaoh to the point of saying, get out of here. Uh, they're now leaving. The picture of a cloud leading in front of them by day and a pillar of fire leading them by night. So they are traveling rapidly. They are moving day and night, the text tells us. And they're going in a what would seemingly be a wrong direction. If they were going to take the, the shortest, the quickest route, it would take them around two weeks to get to Canaan. They would need to go north, and they would need to follow the sea, and they would uh, be there the quickest. However, God tells them to go directly in the opposite direction. Now, God relays that the Philistines are toward the north, and his people, Israel, are not ready to fight. So he tells them to go north. Now there's going to be a problem going north. Is north, there's what's called the wilderness. And this is the place where uh, people don't normally go. And so it's going to cause uh, some problems. It's going to cause people to second guess uh, the, the leaders and the direction that they're going. So if you haven't already read chapter 14 of Exodus... Stop right now and read it. We'll pray, and then we'll walk through it together, and we'll seek to understand um, some more things about it. So, if you have, if you as you go through, there's going to be some places, cities, uh, geographical locations that maybe are hard to pronounce. One is this P Hakrot. Now, you don't worry about. I like the P Hak. You know, get some phlegm in your throat uh, about how to say it. Don't worry about the pronunciation of these names. Just go through, try to pronounce them the best that you can. If not, just say a hard word and move on. The importance of the cities is that these are actually geographic locations. This is a historical narrative. This isn't a story that was made up. So, that being said, Let's pray, and then we'll dive in together. Father God, we love you. We thank you for this day. You know everything that is going to take place today. We, however, do not. But what we do know is you, and we'd like to know you better through the circumstances of today. So we're coming before you right now saying, hey, you're God, and we are are your humble servants. So if what we want to do today, Father, is to get to know you, and we want to help other people get to know you. So use us today. May we be about eternal things today. Uh, things that won't be burned up, but things that will last. So Father, uh, first, renew our minds with your word. And then, soften our souls 
show us problems in our lives where we've made wrong choices, where we are in sin. Show it to us clearly so we can confess and repent. And then our lives can go out into this world and bring glory to you and not to ourselves. So Father, help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chapter 14 begins with a conversation that the Lord is having with Moses. And the Lord, Yahweh, spoke to Moses saying, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before, here's our word, pi hakorot. Uh, you get that in your throat and you'll have it just right. Between Migdal and the sea. Now, you shall camp in front of Baal Zephon, opposite it, by the sea. Now, if you just think for a minute, um, he's saying, okay, Go this way toward the north, and I want you to go as far as the sea. So the sea is going to be in front of them. What we know is the Red Sea, and there is a lot of speculation on where exactly this body of water is as you look at it today. Um, topography changes over time. What we have to understand is that this uh, some people want to translate it the Reed Sea and not the Red Sea. Uh, there's a couple problems with calling it that. Is uh, in several places in the Old Testament and the New Testament, it talks about the Red Sea. Hebrews 11 talks about the Red Sea. In Stephen's sermon that he gives just before they martyr him, it, he talks about the Red Sea. And really, the question comes up of the history of the words. Some people think that the, uh, the word that's translated red or reed is an Egyptian term. And if it was an Egyptian term, people think that it's the word reed. Uh, if it is a Hebrew root word, then it is translated red. And there's all kinds of problems with this. Uh, liberal theologians want to say that it was the Reed Sea and it was a marshy place where, you know, the water was about ankle deep and there were a lot of reeds because reeds don't grow up in deep water. And so in the delta along uh, the Nile River had reeds there. We, we remember when Moses was a baby and his mama put him in a basket, he was among the reeds. And so people want to use this to kind of explain away the supernatural. Um, but you're going to have to deal with the supernatural in the Bible. If you have a problem with the supernatural, you have a problem with God. God is revealing his power. We just read five times in the last chapter that it said, with a powerful hand, God is taking his people out of Egypt. He's the one doing it. Now, what sounds like a greater miracle, walking through water that is really, really, really deep or wading through the swamp? I'm kind of tongue-in-cheek with that. Um, the word Red Sea, if it is, and I believe that it is a Hebrew root word, not an Egyptian root word, then the idea of Red Sea is the sea at the end or the end sea. And it's the, the known area where people uh, traveled. It was at the far end of it. And which would make sense because everything past that is called the wilderness or uninhabited. Maybe the Bedouins would go in there, the tent people. But people, normal people, didn't go past this spot. Because past it was nothing but wilderness. And you can see God in his plan. Instead of going north and taking the short way where every normal, logical person would have gone, he says, go south. And when they go south, they're going to hit the end sea, the Red Sea. There's nowhere to go past the Red Sea. It's just wilderness past that. And when Pharaoh sees it, we're going to read about it in just a minute. We'll get to it. Look what it says in verse 3. It says, for Pharaoh will say... Of the sons of Israel, they are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. God is telling Moses this. 
as soon as Pharaoh hears about them, that they're wandering out there, he's going to think to himself, hey, they're just a bunch of slaves. They're a bunch of idiots. They don't know what they're doing. If they'd have known what they were doing, they would have gone, so they would have gone north, but they went south. And they're, they're just, they're, they're, they're hemmed in. Thus, God goes on and says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart even more. And he will chase after them. They need me. They need to be slaves because they're not smart enough to even walk by themselves outside. That's exactly what Pharaoh's saying. It says, I will be honored, God says, through Pharaoh and all his armies. And the Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh. Okay, so I have this circled in my Bible. I will, I will, I am. God is doing certain things to show who he is. And that is going to happen regardless of mankind's belief or rebellion. We, we see over and over again Pharaoh and the Egyptians rebelling against God, hardening their heart, and then God comes in and hardens their heart and all of it to show that it really doesn't matter what Pharaoh does or doesn't do, God's plan is not going to be thwarted. It's going to happen. And, and I think it would do all of us a lot of good if we would start renewing our mind with the fact that it doesn't matter how many of us get together and vote. It doesn't matter what I think or what my friend group thinks. It matters what God says. And am I submitting to what God says? Am I believing what God says? Or am I pushing back against it and rebelling against it? Simply put, what God says is going to happen. He's God. We're not. In our sinful fallen nature, pride comes up. And pride starts to make us think that we're on the same level with God. I think it's interesting on this month of the year where we talk about um, certain immoral things that God says uh, don't do, and we say we're going to do them, we call it pride. Well, pride isn't just the problem of uh, one small immoral group in the world. It's the problem that every one of us are born with. Pride is... God has said this, but I think something better, and I'm going to follow what I think rather than what God says. The world says pride is a great thing. God says it's the thing that's causing us to be separated from him. Now, verse 5, it says, When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, big surprise, he told them to get out. Pharaoh and his servants had a change of heart toward the people, and they said, What is this that we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? Uh, think about it. Free labor. All of these construction jobs were being done, but they never had to pay them. Uh, look what it says. It says, So he made his chariot ready and took his his people with him, and he took 600 select chariots and all other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. But it says, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. They went out, man, God has done 10 plagues. He has, he has passed over our eldest children and he has redeemed us, and we are marching out as a free people. Well, that sounds great initially, but here comes our old master trying to now uh, reinsert his authority. So the showdown is coming to a head. This uh, same thing is can be thought of in our spiritual world. It, I am born again. I have a new master, Jesus Christ, and his spirit is living in me, guiding me. Yet my flesh and Satan and the world influence are still, still trying to reinsert that. And as I grow in faith, I'm learning 
learning to trust what God says over my fallen thought processes. Romans uh, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beg you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is holy and acceptable, and God, it's your reasonable act of worship. It says, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of the world, but be renewed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The problem is we, we think wrong things. Verse 9, then the Egyptians chased after them with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army. They overtook them, uh, camping by the sea beside Pihakri Rot. There it is. And uh, in front of Baal Zephon, it says, As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marking, marching after them, and they became very frightened. All of the sudden, all of their old feelings are starting to come back. Now, Remember, God, five different times in the last chapter, with great power, with a powerful hand, the Lord has brought them this far. But would it be enough? Here they come again. Here comes the Egyptians. I mean, think about the cry uh, back in chapter 2. Go with me. Back to chapter 2, verse 23. It says, Now it came about in the course of of those many days that the king of Egypt died and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage. And they cried out and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. Remember, they weren't crying out to God. They were just crying out and God heard them. It says, so God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. So God initiated. They're crying out. God initiates, and now they, are, they have responded. But it's, it's an ongoing growth of response. They don't know much about God. They have seen God work in ten plagues, the last one being very vivid in their minds, that their sons, their eldest sons, were spared were passed over, um, but not the Egyptians. And then the Egyptians are telling them to get out, and so they get out, and now the Egyptians are coming back saying, we want you back. So they're scared. They cried, so it says, so the sons of Israel cried out to Yahweh. Good thing? Yes, but you can understand they don't really understand. They cried out to God, and they and then they said to Moses, "It is because is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us to die in the wilderness?" They're looking at Moses, saying, "Are you some kind of idiot? You have brought us to a dead end. You have hemmed us in. There is no hope for us right now but to die. We have the Red Sea in front of us." We have the uh, pursuing Egyptian armies behind us. We are sunk. There's no way out. They go on to say, Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? They're, they're focusing this at Moses. Yet, remember, Moses isn't the one that, by a powerful hand, brought them out of Egypt. And you're, we're going to see this, this interchange between uh, the Israelites and Moses and Yahweh, is that they, they feel very free to complain and murmur against Moses. However, Moses is only doing what Yahweh is telling him to do. And so here you kind of see the schizophrenia of it all. They're, they're, they're calling out, crying out to the Lord and complaining about what God's doing through his leader Moses. And there seems to be a disconnect that Moses and Yahweh are on the same page. It says, uh, by the way, this is, not, this is going to be kind of the pattern throughout 
all of the book of Exodus. There are going to be, this is the first time, there'll be nine more, ten total. Like we had ten plagues coming out of Egypt, there are going to be ten times in the wilderness, this being the first, where the nation of Israel is going to come out and complain against God, and God is going to have to step in and deal with them in, in a real way, sometimes in judgment. This time, God kind of just, and Moses kind of understand and kind of lets it pass. Um, they're, they're growing. God is trying to reveal himself. Look what it said. Verse 12. Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. You can go back to chapter 5, verse 21, and this is kind of what they did say. The question is, would it be better to live your life in slavery and die, or to have a chance at freedom and die. Guess what's going to happen? You're going to die both ways. The question here becomes, how does God fit into the scenario? Remember, first and foremost, we must always come to the text saying, what is God trying to tell us about himself? Has God led them out of Egypt? Yes, with a powerful hand. Has God, is God the one guiding them? Yes, by a cloud during the day and a pillar of fire by night. Did the cloud and the pillar go south or did the cloud and the pillar go north? Well, definitely they went south. So is it Moses guiding them south or is it God? Clearly it's God. Does God ever lead us to places that seem hopeless so that he can reveal his power. And the answer to that is time after time after time after time. God does this. And this will not be an exception. But Moses said to the people, and we, we're going to see a change in Moses over the time in the wilderness. Remember, they're in the wilderness 40 plus years. We see a change. I think the change begins... Later on in Exodus, when he comes down the mountain with the Ten Commandments and he sees them having a drunken orgy in front of a golden calf idol, uh, that he starts to get really mad. And then we're going to see, after they get to Kadesh Barnea and they reject God's uh, plan for them to go in, they take a vote with the ten spies, and uh, our twelve spies, ten had a bad report, only Joshua and Caleb trusted God. So they voted and they said, we can't go in. So God said, turn around and walk in the wilderness in a circle until everyone 20 and older dies. Through that time, man, you start to see the anger of Moses start to be built up. And we'll get to that as we, as we continue our walk through Exodus. Here, this is the, the very first time they're complaining. And so we see pa patience from Moses and we see patience from God. Moses said to the people, do not fear. Stand by and the see the salvation which the Lord, uh, the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. God is going to step into this in such a way that nobody is going to be able to say anything but God did that. God does this over and over again so he gets the glory alone. Otherwise, we in our natural flesh and our natural pride want to rob God and keep some of the glory for ourselves. Well, nobody's going to be able to get any glory from this except by a powerful hand God brought us out of Egypt. And he wants that. He's ordained that to be something that's taught to children from generation to generation. Interesting uh, nuance of words. The word salvation in the Hebrew language is the word Yeshua, which is translated in the Greek Jesus. So think through that and all of uh, what that means. It says, Listen to this. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today. Remember, you see that cloud behind you and you got afraid because here comes our old master. 
Our old master is coming to try to reinsert his authority over us. But our old master has no power greater than our new master. That's what Moses is trying to tell them. And you can trust your new master. Try to grow in this. Try to grow. Ten plagues he brought you out. Now you're starting to complain. Don't complain about your new master. He has the power and he's going to show it to you. He's going to reveal it to you. He says, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Just shut up and watch what God's doing. Trust God. Now, they're going to have the same problem that you and I have problem. I have more of a propensity to trust God when I see things rather than trusting God when I don't see things. In Deuteronomy chapter 3, uh, Deuteronomy is uh, Moses' book of recollecting everything that's going on. He's writing it to his predecessor, who is Joshua, and in Chapter 3, verse 22, he writes this. I'll find it here in a second. He says, Do not fear them, for the Lord your God is the one fighting for you. Same thing at the end as they're going into the promised land to do conquest. Same thing that he told them at the beginning. Now, I think we got to be very careful with this. He said, well, I'm going to make that my life verse. Um, I think God is saying that specifically to Israel right here. I don't want you to fight the Egyptians. You're not ready to fight them. You weren't ready to fight the Philistines. That's why I took you south and not uh, north. There will come a time where God will want them to fight. So we can't just say that God never wants us to fight. I mean, in, in 1 Timothy, it tells us to fight the good fight. We, we need to know what that fight looks like. In Ephesians 6, it says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So... Be careful. This isn't a narrative. God's saying, today you're not going to fight. Today you're going to watch. Just like when they go to Jericho, he says, I, I don't want you to fight, I want you to march. So what we take away from this is, listen to what God is saying. Do what God is revealing in this. Now, we, we can get to, well, what about now? God isn't speaking directly to us. Well, in Hebrews... Chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In these last days, God in past has spoken various ways and at various times, but now he's speaking through his Son. Go back and read or watch the videos on Hebrews. Look what it says here. Verse 15, Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you still crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. Stop talking. Get moving. Uh, uh, oh, I wanted to read a couple more verses for you. Let's go to Psalm 46, verse 10. Psalm 46. Psalm 46 and verse 10 says, Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And I think it's fairly common for us to want to exalt ourselves. And so if we can get to the place where we can start understanding, who am I trying to exalt in what I'm trying to do right now? It will kind of give us some perspective. Go to the next book, to Proverbs chapter 29. In Proverbs 29, read verse uh, 25. It says this, the fear of man brings a trap or a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. 
So again, we've said the Lord is going to be exalted in the earth. Here it's saying, I'm going to be exalted. How am I going to be exalted? By trusting the Lord and making his name great. By carrying out what I was created to do. Uh, go to the New Testament. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Philippians 4, 6, it says this. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I, I need this verse. They needed this verse. Stop fearing what you see behind you. Stop fearing your old enemy. Stop fearing all the things that are from our flesh and trying to exalt ourselves. And just trust God and what God has said. One more text. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, look with me at verse 13. And there's a reason we want to um, understand this. Right now, Israel, in our text in Exodus, is going through a difficult time. God has led them to this difficult time. Why? So first they could get to know God, and second so they could be a testimony to the Egyptians and to all the world that is watching them right now. I think if personally and corporately, I have this problem personally, and I think it's not just a problem that I alone have, but as an American um, and as a Christian, I tend to, to look at persecution very wrongly. I, I tend to think of it as a negative rather than a positive. Uh, well, of course, nobody likes to be persecuted. Um, but especially when you feel like you're doing what is right. Let's read this. It says, Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of being right with God, you are blessed. So if you looked at Israel, what they're going through, you would say, are they blessed? They're hemmed in uh, by the water in the wilderness, and they're hemmed in behind by their enemy that wants to take them back to slavery. Woo, man, they are blessed. Why are they blessed? Because they're going to see something about the character and the power of God that they would never see if they had never been put in that situation. They're going to be able to witness to the world in a way that they never could before. Look what it says in this text. It says, do not fear their intimidation. Do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks to give an account for the hope that is in you. Yet with do this with gentleness and reverence keeping a good conscience, so that the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right, rather than for doing what is wrong. They're in a spot, and they're just in the inception of getting to know God. So let's give them a little bit of a break. Go back with me to Exodus 14, verse 15. God says, are you still talking? Moses, are you still talking? It's time to stop praying and it's time to start doing. Start leading them forward. As for you, he says, I want you to lift your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of of the sea on dry land. I meant to do this. Take your pen, and every place you see dry land, I want you to circle it. Dry land. Okay, now. I want you to picture this. This vast body of water in front of you. And God says, take your staff and touch it. He touches it. It divides. As for me, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. 
and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians will know what? They'll know that there's only one God, and they are being confronted by him. Think about all of the time that Pharaoh and the rest of the Egyptians had to push God away. How many times have this God offered himself to them? How many times has God revealed to I mean, ten plagues, the last one being very vivid. Yet they're still chasing after them. Don't understand that they are dealing with something bigger than themselves. Every person must come to the understanding that first there is a God and that we're accountable to this God. Look what it says. It says, Then the Lord, then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I am honored through Pharaoh, through his chariots and his horsemen. God is honored through salvation, and God is honored through judgment. Why? Because in both directions, regardless of whether we submit to God or we continue to rebel against him, the way God is honored is by revealing himself through his word and his word taking place. The angel of God, who had been, verse 19, going before the camp of Israel, moved. Remember, the, the pillar of fire and the cloud were in front of them, guiding them by day. But now they know completely where they need to go, because God says, Moses touched the water, boom, it's divided, there's dry land, I want you to go to the other side. They don't need a cloud or a pillar of fire to show them where to go. So the, it moves and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud moved before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of, the, of Egypt and the camp of Israel. There was a cloud along with the darkness, yet it gave light at night. Thus, the one did not come near the other all night. So it had to have been just about dusk when Moses touches the water with his staff. God divides the water. He tells them to get moving. They get going into the water, and the army is very close. And so what happens is the cloud comes behind, and goes between. No more can Israel see the Egyptians coming up behind them, but also no longer can the Egyptians know where the Israelites are. And it's almost as if, what well is, he darkened the way for the Egyptians, let lit the way for the Israelites. And so they're really close initially. But through this, and what we're going to read, God makes their way dark, and even at night, he lights the way so the, the Israelites can keep going all night. And they're, they're making time. And we're going to see that the Egyptians are going to have trouble. Look what it says. Uh, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land so that the water waters were divided. Okay, so again, let me preface what I've said. He touches it, it's divided, all night it dries, they're going across, but it must have took them a couple days to get across. It says, the sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on dry land, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. For those that say that they didn't walk through a deep body of water, but it was just a marsh, I don't know what's more miraculous, that God made a wall of water uh, out of the marsh, or, or whether uh, they, the Egyptians drowned in ankle-deep water and covered their uh, chariots. It, it's, if you have problem with supernatural, you're going to have problems with the Bible right from Genesis 1-1. Because the whole Bible is God, who is a supernatural spiritual being, revealing himself. And he does things that we simply cannot do, like let there be light. Verse 23, Then the Egyptians took up the pursuit, and all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen, went in after them into the midst of the sea. 
at the morning watch, 4 a.m., the Lord looked down at the armies of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud and brought the army of the Egyptians into confusion. Remember, he's lighting the way for the Israelites. He's darkening the way for the Egyptians. Then he caused he, he brought the army of the Egyptians into confusion. He caught how? He caused their chariot wheels to swerve. Uh, some people say that it's because of mud, but over and over again in this text, it keeps saying dry land, dry land, dry land. So again, this is supernaturally, God is causing their chariot wheels to come apart, to fall off, to not work right. And he made them drive with difficulty. So even if they didn't come off, maybe they're doing this. I don't know if you've ever driven with your car where it's out of alignment. Their speed is impeded. So the Egyptians said, there's something bigger going on here. They understood more than liberal theologians know. God is doing something here. He says, let us flee from Israel. Let's go the other way. Think about what's happened. Ten plagues. They've already gone through showing that Israel... God, the one true God, is fighting for Israel. And whether you believe that Amun-Ra or the rest of the Egyptian gods are real or just demons, whatever they are, they don't have as much power as Yahweh. Some of them are starting to understand. It says, let us flee from Israel, for the Yahweh is fighting for them against us. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may come back over the Egyptians, over their chariots, and over their horses, their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak, while the Egyptians were fleeing right into it. Then the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, even Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after them. Not even one of them remained. Not Pharaoh. doesn't say Pharaoh got killed. All of his army. But, the big but here, the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were like a wall uh, to them on their right hand and on their left. So here, we see a theme that is going to, starting here and going to go throughout Scripture, that Yahweh is not only a God who saves, but he's also a God who judges. The dividing line between whether God saves or whether God judges is whether we have faith in what he has said. Now, the Egyptians had plenty of opportunity to believe in what God has said, but they would not. They hardened their hearts, and then God hardened their hearts. And now it comes to fruition. Think about it. God had redeemed Israel at Passover. But really, they weren't truly liberated until right now. And I can't believe people who read the Bible and study the Bible could actually want to minimize what God is doing here. Uh, think about it. In, in verse 28, it makes it clear that there's enough water here for all the armies of Egypt to die. It couldn't have been just a marsh. It's not the Sea of Reeds. In the next chapter, we're going to see that Israel saw their deliverance as being supernatural. Not only that, you can go to Psalm 106. Uh, they believed this for generations. Not only that, if you go to Joshua, it's Joshua chapter 2 and Joshua chapter 9. The other nations around there, especially the Canaanites where the promised land was, they heard about what happened at the Red Sea and they also believed that it was supernatural and they were scared to death. So how pompous are we to come at it thousands of years later saying, ah, oh, it wasn't that big of a deal. With a powerful hand, the Lord 
brought them out. Verse 30, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. A couple things. We're going to see them crawfish fairly quickly from this fear of the Lord. Why? Because their belief is by sight, not by faith. Um, you, you can go back to the Gospel of John. In John 20, verse 29, where it says, Hey, it's great that you believe when you've seen me, but it's even greater if you believe without seeing. True faith. I do think that Moses, right here, being called God's servant by God, it's the highest title that any mortal human being could be given by God. That I'm God's slave. I'm God's servant. Now, for another person to enslave me is totally wrong. But for God to enslave me would have to be my choice to surrender to him. Not a higher not a higher title could be given to human beings. I want us to finish today by reading a couple of texts. Uh, first, let's go to Romans chapter 6, and then we'll go to 1 Corinthians. Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, it's talking about baptism. And we're going to see that the crossing of the Red Sea is going to be used as a picture or a type, what we've been saying, of baptism, going through the waters. Remember, baptism is a picture of justification. They were justified um, by the blood over the doorpost, right, in faith of what's going to come. Uh, they were redeemed. Yet, that was a picture to the lost world. They were redeemed at Passover, yet that picture wasn't revealed to the whole world until they passed through the water. Um, a testimony of, of that. And we see that in, in chapter 6 of Romans, verse 4, it says, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that is, Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we might walk in newness of life. This idea that Israel, this is talking about salvation in Christ, but back here, this type or this picture of it is they come out on the other side of the Red Sea. There's nothing but uninhabited wilderness in front of them, yet it's a new life. They are no longer slaves, and their old master is done. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's read the first 14 verses and then we'll close out today. It says, I do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, that our fathers, who were all under the cloud, led by the cloud, and all passed through the sea, that's the crossing of the Red Sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. I mean, God led them there. And all ate the same spiritual food. We'll get to that. And all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock, which followed them. And the rock was Christ. Christ all the way back in the Exodus. It says, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased. For they were laid low in the wilderness. Even though God has revealed all this powerful stuff in front of them, most of them did not trust God. Now these things, it says, happened as an example for us. So that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be adult idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did. 
and 23,000 of them fell in one day. We'll get to that. Nor let us try the Lord's hand as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. One of the 10 times where they're complaining and rebelling against the Lord. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Verse 11. Now, these things happened to them as an example. And they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Don't start thinking that you got this and that you're strong enough, and you ain't never going to whatever. It says this, No temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man. God is faithful. God's power is the one that can bring us through. Not my own, God's. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide you the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. The way, not the ways, but the way to flee temptation. When this says God always gives us a way of escape, there's always a path. God doesn't tempt, but God puts me in circumstances where I am tempted to try to get out of it, to try to have an easy way. God wants me to just... Trust him. He's the way. He's the way. Not me. Not my scheming. I don't know if you've ever sat in bed and thought through different scenarios of how you could figure things out and work things out. If we could stop, just say, God, I'm coming to you. God, you show me what I need to be about. What I need to do in this circumstance. Show me. And when it gets to the situation where things seem absolutely impossible, I'm in a trap, God. Let God show us what he's trying to reveal about himself. May God honor the reading of his word today and the deliverance that God brought to Israel. And may we trust that as God told them he would deliver them, and he did. As God has told us he would deliver us, he Father, we love you. We thank you again for your word. We thank you for all these pictures and types that you've given us in the Old Testament that point to the, the salvation in your son, Jesus Christ. Father, it is in him we live, and it's in him we have our being. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.